Seattle is now only a little over an hour from Miami by Panama American Clipper. The sight of New Providence Island signals the beginning of the end of our flight to Nassau, which is situated at the eastern end of the island. The gleaming white buildings of Government House, the lighthouse on the western tip of Hog Island, and Fort Charlotte guarding Nassau's harbor may be identified from the air. The island of New Providence is only 21 miles long and 7 miles wide with a population of about 30,000. It was a major base of the Royal Air Force during World War II. Here on New Providence Island, we shall enjoy leisurely sightseeing with an endless array of diversions. Excellent fishing, sailing or bathing in the brilliantly hued waters that border the semi-tropical islands are among the most popular spots. Rawson Square from the steps of the post office. Believe it or not, I'm waiting for a streetcar. The native market in Rawson Square. Hats, bags, and rugs woven by native women and colorfully adorned with bright seashells and ornaments. You'll find an attractive variety of native handicraft on display in this informal open-air market in Rawson Square. The picturesque markets scattered along Nassau's busy wharves are well worth visiting for a liberal education in the exotic fruits, vegetables, and marine life of the Bahamas. The beautifully proportioned post office House of Assembly and other government buildings, one of your first glimpses after disembarking from your ship at Prince George's Wharf. Queen Victoria's statue looks across Bay Street. Bay Street, where it passes Rawson Square in the heart of Nassau. And in the background, a century-old building with intricate ironwork shutters. Bay Street runs along the length of the city of Nassau, and along its course, the scene changes from banks and modern buildings to the quaint, old-fashioned, horse-drawn carriages, which serve as taxis and a convenient means of transportation for sightseers. Gregory's Arch on Market Street was named after Governor John Gregory and was completed in 1852. From Grantstown, it's an uphill climb to Fort Fincastle on Bennett's Hill off E Street. The water tower is usually the first landmark seen by ships. An elevator allows us to obtain a panoramic view of the city and surrounding country. Captain Eden has prepared the brazen hussy for another trip to Rose Island.
the camera will assist in perpetuating the memory of this enchanting picture book playground. Today, Mr. Charles Freeman, manager of the Royal Victoria, and his family will accompany the guests to the powdery white sand beaches of Rose Island. Native, bo native diving boys are always at hand, willing to display their unusual ability at diving for coins, of course. demonstration. century buccaneers, pirates, and Spanish men of war rode at anchor here in Nassau's lovely harbor in the brief intervals between their ruthless marauding expeditions and bloody forays at sea. Today, ancient cannon and old ship's figureheads guard trim yachts, great cruise liners, and picturesque native schooners from the out islands. Aboard our cruiser, Brazen Hussey, over cobalt, turquoise, and azure waters. We are on our way to the Royal Victoria Beach Club on enchanting Rose Island. its shoreline, and the fact that it is Nassau's nearest out island, one of the most beautiful in the Bahamas, makes it a never-to-be-forgotten retreat. Game fish of all types abound in the water surrounding this island retreat. The world's record wahoo and other large sailfish, as well as all other varieties of game fish, have been caught in the waters directly in front of the Royal Beach Victoria Club. The main clubhouse with its community living room faces a protected yacht harbor. One of the most beautiful white sand beaches in the Bahamas stretches in front of the club. Ah, if you ever dreamt of going native on the beach of a tropical island, here's the spot. 
Let's enjoy all of the carefree pleasures with none of the practical discomforts. Following a refreshing drip in water that averages 70 degrees, even in the winter time, is there anything that tastes better than food served picnic style in the soft subtropical breezes? And can you imagine all of this and no income tax? That's right. The colony operates under a system of indirect taxation and has never found it necessary to introduce income tax. Even the customs duty on the staple foods is negligible, and the only direct taxation is a moderate real property tax on improved property. Turning for a moment from the beauties of these subtropical islands, let's spend a few moments with Mr. Howard Dyken, inventor of underwater camera equipment. Howard Dyken has spent years experimenting with an idea. These cases contain the results of years of painstaking effort to produce cameras which will operate underwater. Let's have Howard explain these cameras in his own way. This is a regular Weston light meter for securing the proper light for the picture. In order to get the light underwater, it is necessary to take this instrument underwater. It is mounted in a plexiglass airtight case. About 10 pounds of air pressure is put into the case to ensure against it leaking. The case is taken underwater to get the reading direct. This is a 35 millimeter Claris camera mounted in a plexiglass airtight case. We also put 10 pounds of air pressure in this case through this valve to prevent or to ensure against its leaking. The three controls necessary to operate the camera underwater are brought out through the case in a in the airtight joints. The first one here is the focus lever which makes it possible to focus the camera underwater. The other one is the the knob here on top which winds the film and sets the shutter. The third one here is the shutter trip which takes the picture when the object is sighted. Now out here at Rose Island, let's take this equipment underwater to see what it'll do. And here is Howard Dyken in action. He has traveled all of the way from Minnesota to these clear view waters of the surrounding Rose Island to test the product of his inventive genius. Still in motion picture cameras, which will produce views of life as it exists beneath the surface of this subtropical fairyland. Howard has not only perfected the underwater cameras, but from odd bits of hose and a washing machine motor, has perfected an air system which allows him to descend below the surface of the water. Dr. William Clark of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, is his associate in these underwater picture-taking adventures. Howard and the doctor have become experienced in this underwater hobby, but for us landlubbers, uh, the role of spectator is more, uh, more inviting. What do you think? Howard Eldon is another of these underwater men, but Harold's specialty is spear fishing. A mask and a spear constitutes his sole equipment and weapon. The clear water and the abundance of fish provides all visitors to Nassau with a chance to try this thrilling, thrilling sport. The goggles may be rented, 
And armed with a spear, you hunt for fish instead of hauling them up at the end of a line. This kind of angling is done in shallow water, usually less than six feet. These waters were discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1492, his first landing being at San Salvador in this Bahamas group. Underwater with a spear and a chance to match your skill with some of the fastest underwater creatures. Let's watch Hell's Eldon and see what his luck might be. Ah, a turtle, nice hunting, Harold. 